Okay, we're going to be talking about Spirit-filled, Spirit-baptized. Now, recently, we started a two-part series on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And what we did, we studied a variety of scriptures that pertain to this particular baptism. Now, this week, what we're going to be doing, we're going to discuss the difference between being Spirit-filled and being Spirit-baptized. You know, have you ever wondered what the difference is? Well, I think you're going to find this Bible study can be very helpful. Now, I've had a lot of people who are baptized in the Holy Spirit, people who have their prayer language, and they'll come to me and they'll say that when they have people come to them with a problem, that they can give them answers from the Word, and and they'll usually sense the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit while they're ministering. And sometimes the gifts and the manifestations of the Holy Spirit will, will be operating, and uh, they'll feel all lifted up and full of joy while they're ministering. But then later, when they are alone, they feel empty and even depressed. And they they feel like their answers work for everybody else, but they're not working for them. And this kind of panics a lot of people. And they know that uh, they haven't held back. They know that they've gone to the Lord and said, Lord, we want all you've got. We want all of your ministry tools. And so they're not understanding exactly what's going wrong. Well, a lot of the time, they're even going to feel guilty because of this emptiness. They think, well, something's wrong. You know, why am I feeling empty? And they realize they've been blessed so much by God that they can't imagine why they're going to feel empty. And then to compound the problem sometimes, these same people will usually name several good old saints, you know, who are godly and they're happy and loving and they're peaceful and they have a real sweet spirit and inner security. And yet those dear old saints might be absolutely against the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You know, many of them would reject it even if they had uh, had been told about it. So those people from the first group, those baptized in the Holy Spirit, are puzzled because they seemingly feel emptier than the others at times, in spite of the fact now that they have the baptism. And so I've had many of them come to me and say, what is this? What's going on? Well, some of you may feel that uh, you've been in that situation that I just described, and it may be puzzling to you too. Okay, so what is wrong? We need to talk about that. Why would somebody then with the baptism of the Holy Spirit sometimes feel emptier than somebody else who loves God but doesn't have the baptism? Well, the word empty now is the clue word. I want you to remember that word empty. Okay, let's just go a little deeper. Getting baptized now in the Holy Spirit and getting Spirit-filled, these are two different experiences that can come only to a born-again believer. But they're very legitimate experiences. And I want us to look at when the disciples had their born-again experience. In John 20, 19 and 20, you need to mark that in your Bible, Jesus had just been resurrected from the dead. And that evening, he appeared to the disciples, and he showed them the scars on his hand. He showed them uh, uh, his side. And all of that's in John 20, 19 and 20. So in verse 20 now, they recognize him, and they acknowledge him now as the risen Lord. And they begin rejoicing. They're so excited. And then the next verse in John 20, 22, Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And when they received the Holy Spirit, they became born again at that very moment. So this was their born again experience. John 20, verse 22, you need to mark it in your Bible. And at the time of the new birth, when they accepted Jesus, uh, when we receive the Holy Spirit, we don't have to be baptized in the Holy Spirit to have the Holy Spirit. The minute we accept Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit, and He comes with the new birth the moment that we accept Jesus. Now, I've heard a lot of people say, well, I have the Holy Spirit. They're referring to the time when they got the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But that's an error because uh, if they're saved, they already have the Holy Spirit. They have the Holy Spirit on the inside of them because that's how we get saved. The Holy Spirit breathes life into us, and that causes us to come into this new birth. It causes our spirit man to be reborn. And when that happens, then all of a sudden, we are born out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. And our destiny at that moment changes from hell to heaven. We have a new father and our spirit man is born again. Now, these disciples got the Holy Spirit the moment that Jesus breathed into them on that first day after the resurrection, the very day that he was resurrected. And at that point, they became new creations, but they didn't have the baptism. Now, remember, Jesus stayed 40 days more. And at the end of that 40 days, now, right before he ascended now to the Father, uh, Jesus commanded them 
in Acts 1, 4 through 5, he commanded them to wait in Jerusalem. He didn't suggest it. He commanded it. And uh, he said, wait until you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. And this will happen not many days from now. And sure enough, 10 days later, 10 days after the ascension, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Even though they had already received the Holy Spirit now, you know, back on the day that they first saw the Lord after he was resurrected. And that's when he breathed the Holy Spirit into them. Okay, now our first infilling is our born again experience. Okay, now what I want us to do is I want us to examine the next experience that God expects us to receive. I mean, actually, he commanded us to receive it. After many born uh, again, there are... Um, there's an initial one-time experience called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, there's going to be a specific point now, a specific point in time that we can all point to and say, that's when I was baptized. That's when I was immersed in the Holy Spirit. My one-time experience came when I was in New Orleans. So everybody that's baptized in the Spirit, they will have a one-time experience that they can put their finger on, they can mark it on a calendar. Now, John the Baptist referred to it in Luke 3, verse 16, when he said, one comes after me who is mighty, mightier than I. His shoestrings I'm not worthy to untie. And when he comes, he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. That's Acts 1, 3 through 5. Now, here is the fulfillment of what John was prophesying. John restated it in Acts 1, 3 through 5. After his death and resurrection, Jesus presented himself alive to the apostles by many infallible proofs, appearing to them for 40 days and speaking concerning the kingdom of God. And being assembled with them, he commanded them. You need to mark that in your Bible. He commanded them, do not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, of which you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Okay, now Jesus referred to this one-time experience now as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But I want you to notice now in verse 4, Jesus also called it the promise of the Father which is exactly the same thing. If you see the promise of the Father, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's talking about the same thing. And also, I want you to take note again of that word commanded. Every time you see that, you need to underline it. Now, Jesus didn't just suggest that they wait for the baptism. He commanded them to wait. Now, that should speak to us. You know, that wasn't just someone in the Bible saying, okay, you need to wait for the baptism. That's God. God himself, Jesus himself commanding it, not just suggesting it. Then in verse 8, 10 days later, it came to pass on the day of Pentecost. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a one-time experience, but there's another experience separate from the baptism, which is not a one-time experience. It's a continual daily infilling of the Holy Spirit, which is absolutely just as important. Now, I want you to notice I said daily, and that's what the Bible calls it, being filled daily with the Holy Spirit. And that's why I entitled this Bible study, Spirit-Filled, Spirit-Baptized. Now, most of the New Testament writers and Jesus use these two terms. They'll both use these, Spirit-Filled, Spirit-Baptized, because these are two different separate experiences. Okay, now let me give you this illustration. You can take a glass and you can fill it with water, and it's all contained on the inside, and you can pour the liquid out of the glass and you can refill it many times, as many times as you like. But you can also take the glass and you could put it down on, in a, to a bucket of water. And then it's not just filled on the inside, but then it's covered inside and out. Okay, that's a good analogy of these two experiences. Spirit filled, filling that glass on the inside. But spirit baptized is when you put that glass down in there and it's filled inside and out. And that's what God wants for us. He wants us to be spirit baptized where we're filled with the Holy Spirit inside and out. But neither one of these experiences now is when uh, you get the Holy Spirit initially. See, these two experiences are when you receive the Holy Spirit in greater measure. Okay, now once a person is saved, once a person receives the Holy Spirit, that person can be refilled with the Holy Spirit daily. You know, he can have the Holy Spirit breathed into him again and again and again by just communicating with God, communing with God. And that can be without even, uh, uh, without ever getting baptized or immersed in the Spirit. He can be continually filled with the Spirit.
It's kind of like that glass. It can be filled over and over. Now, being filled with the Holy Spirit should be a continual daily process, should be something that we seek after every single day. And that's exactly how the the Christian grows spiritually. Being daily filled is taking in that daily nourishment. That's when we're singing to the Lord. That's when we're reading our Bible. That's when we're praying. That's when we're seeking God on everything that we do. And when we seek Him that way to get that daily nourishment now, it's going to give us spiritual growth. Just like you would feed a child nourishing food in the natural, uh, that's going to give him physical growth. Okay, being filled daily now with the Holy Spirit gives us our spiritual growth. And uh, because as we are daily filled now, we begin to come into the image of God and we begin taking on the character of God. And the fruit of the Holy Spirit then begins to become abundant in our life. The love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the goodness, the gentleness, the faith, and the self-control. These are the nine fruit of the Spirit. And being filled daily with the Holy Spirit causes a, a, a fruit production. It causes a fruit crop is what, what we have. If we'll yield to Him and, and over and over, it, it just continues to grow within us. Okay, now Acts 13, verse 52. These disciples had received the Holy Spirit back at the time uh, when they received the risen Lord. So they already had the Holy Spirit uh, on the inside. Uh, And they got that the night of the resurrection. Then they were baptized in the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. But they still had to be continually filled even after the baptism. It wasn't just enough to get the baptism. They had to be continually filled. In Acts 13, 52, it was a continuous process as the disciples were filled with joy, joy in the Holy Spirit. They, they were filled with the Word over and over. Now, Stephen is an example of someone now who was Spirit-filled and Spirit-baptized. Now, there's a lot of examples in the New Testament, but I'm going to use Stephen because you could tell he was continually being filled with the Holy Spirit. He had all of the fruit of the Holy Spirit because the character of Jesus was evident in his life. But we also know that he had the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You know, you could see the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit because he had the power and the anointing to openly proclaim the gospel. He wasn't just sitting in his room and uh, having communion with God. I mean, he's out, he's out shouting the, the good news to the people uh, in spite of the danger, in spite of the, the persecution. It was all around him. But he was, he was so filled with uh, the baptism that he was really putting it out. He was telling everybody he came in contact with. And Acts 7, verse 55, it says, But being filled of the Holy Spirit... In other words, he was keeping himself filled up personally. Then he, Stephen, gazed into heaven and he saw the glory of God and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And then Acts 7, 59 through 60, they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God, praying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he knelt down and he cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And having said this, he fell asleep. Okay, now that kind of calm assurance now, that that kind of manifested fruit didn't come just from that initial one-time baptism of the Holy Spirit. It didn't come from that. Stephen had the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and that had given him the boldness to go out and preach the gospel. Uh, The baptism had given him the power to be a witness and the power to be able to stand up without fear and and tell these people, even though he knew that he was taking his life in his own hands. But uh, what we see in verse 55 was the ability then to trust God with calm assurance and the ability to see into the heavens and see the glory of God and see Jesus and to be able then to pray in verse 60, don't hold this sin against them. So what you see here in the last moments of Stephen's life was the evidence of being filled with the Spirit. He had the baptism and it caused him to go out and preach. But when he was calm and and he wasn't afraid and he could pray for their forgiveness, that was evidence of being daily filled with the Spirit.
Now, Jesus talks about this experience. He talks about this spirit-filled life because he, we have to have both. We can't just pick one or the other. And every time Jesus taught about something in the Gospels now, he taught it very simply, and he would often use word pictures. I loved that about when Jesus would teach. He would use word pictures that helped us to understand. And he would describe what he was saying but so uh, we actually could come into a much better understanding. Now, we find that Jesus described both the baptism of the Holy Spirit and being filled with the Spirit. And he did it now with a very vivid word picture to describe each one of them. In John 4, 13 and 14, describes being filled with the Spirit. Jesus said, everyone who drinks of the water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him, he'll never thirst. Indeed, the water that I shall give him will become in him a well of water springing up into eternal life. Okay, he's given us a picture now so that we can better understand it. He, he's calling it a well. Now, I want you to notice he's saying the water that I give will become in him a well. You need to circle that word because on the inside is where that well is. Now, the minute Jesus uses this word picture, we automatically have a mind picture. We have a mental picture because most of us are very familiar with whales. We've seen a lot of whales. And what are the characteristics of a whale? Well, in the first place, it's inside the ground. You know, uh, now we build a lot of things on the outside that holds water. We have reservoirs, we have tanks, but a whale is always underground. Now you may see the casement around the whale, but the whale itself and, and the water in that whale, it's always underground and it's out of sight. Okay, that water never flows up and out of that well onto the ground. So if you want the water out, you're going to have to pump, pump it out because it's not going to come out on its own. There's even times when the water in a well would get so low that it has to regain its fill height before, uh, before it does you any good. Okay, now there was a time that if you drove through the countryside, you would notice that every little farmhouse had their well. They had their own individual wells. Now there was enough water in that well that if someone dropped by and asked for a drink of water, there would have been enough to give that person a drink of water. But for the most part, that well was just one particular, uh, was uh, uh, there for that one particular farmhouse. It was not intended to supply water for the whole community. Now, that's why everyone had their own well. Now, if you'll listen carefully to this analogy, you'll never get this experience confused again. Because if a well gets partially cut off from the source of water supply, that well's going to get lower and lower, the water in the well. Now, everyone has a well on the inside. Even the, the lost man has a well. There just doesn't happen to be any water in his well, but he has a well there. It's waiting to be filled. And then at the moment of our new birth, when we accept Jesus as our Savior, that's what initially now fills our well with water. And that water then starts springing up for eternal, uh, up for eternal life. Now, the original uh, filling of that well when we got born again, it's never going to be enough to keep you going to become an overcomer. It's not going to be enough for that it ha because it has to be refilled daily. You know, it doesn't, doesn't say full. And you've heard testimonies of people who simply accepted Jesus back in, say, 1936 or whenever, you know. Now, if that's all there is to their testimony, their well is going to get mighty low. You know, see, we continually use from our spiritual well because we're in a spiritual warfare, whether we know it or not, and we're using out of that well and it's going to get low. If it's not connected to the source continually, it'll get lower and lower, so low that you can physically feel the emptiness. Now, I told you earlier that the word empty is the uh, clue word. As the well uh, gets uh, that's on the inside of you, as it gets slow, you feel that emptiness. If a physical well had feelings, it too would feel empty as the water level went down. And God knew that. He knew our well that springs up water of eternal life would get lower and lower and we'll, would feel empty. And that's why he made provisions to take care of that emptiness. And Ephesians 5, 18 tells us, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. So he tells us exactly what to do. Now, he wouldn't have given us this commandment uh, if that well was never going to get low. He knew our, the well would get low. He knew we were going to have to continually be filled with the Spirit. It's not something we did one time. 
Now, the baptism of the Holy Spirit was a one-time experience, but not the infilling. Now, a good barometer is the moment that you begin to feel empty, you can know that your whale's getting low. And how do you continually feel the whale? Well, exactly the same way that a natural whale feels full and stays full. A natural well is connected to an underground spring, and as long as there's no obstructions now, that fill height is going to automatically stay up as it stays connected to the source. And God fills our well the same way he says, you draw near to me, you stay connected to me, and draw near to me, and when you do, that's James uh, 4, verse 8, and he said, when you do, as long as you stay connected to me, to the source, in vital union, with no obstructions, he said, we're going to find that we're going to stay filled with the Spirit. But it's easy to let other things come in our way and uh, get our attention, and our well starts going down. Now, this is what I experienced in the past. I would feel empty, so I'd really get busy trying to combat the feelings because that feeling, you can feel the emptiness. And I would look for things to stay busy. And sometimes, you know, I would... Um, get up in the mornings, and I'd feel empty, and so I, I, I'd say, okay, I think I'll go back to sleep, and I'd go back to bed and try to sleep it off, but do you know what would happen? Just exactly the opposite. I'd get emptier and emptier. See, when we feel empty, we don't feel like doing the very things that would solve the problem. Now, Satan always puts up a smoke screen to ver divert us from the truth, well, the Lord began to show me that he wanted to call me now uh, to stay connected to the source. He said, that's the secret. Just like with the physical well, it has to stay connected to the source. Now, God may show you something else, but this is what he showed me to do from experience. And I can say it, it worked. He told me he wanted me to get up at least an hour ahead of time before the family, before the phone calls, before the hustle and bustle of another day. And he said, spend time alone with me. And the first time, thing that he had me do, he had me to begin by thanking him for everything that I could think of. And he said, I want you to do it out loud. Don't want you to do it in, in your head. Do it out loud. And uh, thank me for everything that you are appreciative for. And uh, he said, then I want you to sing praises to me. And I want you to sing those praises out loud. Then I want you to read the word. And I don't want you to read it to yourself. I want you to read it out loud. And he wanted me to begin out loud casting every care one at the time over on him. And he said, I want you to name it and then give it to me. And he wanted me to take the activities of the day one at the time and out loud hand them over to him, committing all of my ways to the Lord and uh, have that time of vital union with him and stay connected. And you know what? It worked. It worked beautifully. I thought, Lord, this is such a simple thing for you to tell us to do that keeps our well full. And as, as I did that, my well was full and I was ready for the day. Now, it's during these times that God begins by his Holy Spirit now to convict our spirit man of areas in our life that are not right. You know, fleshly habits. Uh, this is, these are the times when, you know, when you're talking to the Lord out loud and you're quoting his word and you're praying to him, he'll start showing you those areas of selfishness. He'll start showing you those uh, selfish habits and sin, you know. And uh, as he does and as we get rid of them, that's what keeps us connected to the source. And if we'll yield these areas to him during these times uh, of fresh and filling, then he'll continue to work work on us. He'll continue to, to start cleaning us up. And that's when the fruit of the Spirit then begins to grow. But if we stubbornly now hang on to them, what it'll do, it'll pollute our well every time. But so many times we're so busy and we have so much to do that we think, oh Lord, I just don't have time to, to spend that alone time with you. I'll, I'll do it tomorrow. I don't have time to do it today. And we think we have to get up and get with it. And, uh, uh, we think, if I don't do this, I'll, I won't be able to get everything done. Listen, there is nothing in this world that is more important than keeping our well filled. There's nothing more important than that. When we are communing with Him in the Spirit, what it's doing is it's filling our well. It's keeping that well full. Now, there's nothing important than this time of being spiritually filled with the Spirit. And it's not an option. You know, most Christians think, well, that's an option. You know, that'd be good if I do that. Well, whether we think so or not, it's an absolute necessity. 
You know, have you ever been driving your car and you noticed that it was getting low on gas? And you kept thinking, oh, golly, this gas gauge is getting lower and lower, you know. And um, uh, we wouldn't think of saying, well, I have to just keep going. I just don't have enough time to stop and get gas. You know, I, I, I can't stop. I can't fill my car. I just don't have the time. Well, we know better than that. We know we'd be walking in, in no time. And yet we do the same thing with God. We're getting lower and lower on our, uh, on our communication with Him. We just think, I don't have time. And what we don't realize is we run out of gas. <laughs> we run out of our spiritual uh, gas just exactly like a car runs out. But you know, when our spirit uh, well gets empty, we have a tendency now to put off the thing that we have to do simply because uh, you know, we don't know, we, we don't think about the fact we have to do that. And uh, we don't do it just simply because we feel empty. But that is the signal that God's giving to us. Now, a well left empty will affect us physically, it'll affect us spiritually, it'll affect us emotionally, and it'll affect us financially every single time. And you'll finally be on foot. Or sometimes you might say, we'd be off of our feet, <laughs> you know. Uh, that spiritual water is springing up when it springs up on the inside of us as, as we keep that well filled. It, it's giving us life, not just eternal life, but also life for living in this world. Now, if we let our, our well get empty, there is absolutely no life for the living day to day. And we don't stop sometime to realize this is literal when God's telling us, you, you, you run out, <laughs> uh, now, we know that in the physical, but sometimes we don't pick up on it in the, in the spiritual. Now, years ago when we were building our house, Jack was doing most of the building, and he was holding down a full-time job with a rotating shift, and he was also doing a lot of church work. He was doing a lot of counseling. So it came to the point that he had very little time to just get away and be alone with God. I mean, every moment of his day and most of his night was filled. And his well was getting lower and lower. And he was being drained, and we just kept thinking, oh, as soon as we get this house finished and get the house built, then we can get back to normal living. And so he kept pushing himself. Well, finally, it affected even his physical body until his immune system was really down. Because, see, when our well gets low, it affects every part of our being. So he was going through the house one day, and he hit his leg pretty hard, and he got a real ugly bruise but he didn't pay that much attention to it. But his boot kept rubbing on it. And about a week later, he came home from work. He was working at 3M at the time. It's before he had gone full time in the ministry. And he came home from work in the middle of the day, and he was delirious. And it was a matter of hours. He had blood poisoning throughout his entire blood system. Now, under normal conditions, our physical body... Uh, you know, has a lot of resistance against these kinds of things. But he had gotten so drained physically, emotionally, and every other way that he didn't have any resistance, and he was in really serious condition. Now, the Lord was merciful, thank goodness, and intervened, and he got well. But there was another guy in town the same week died of that very thing. He had uh, something that got infected, and he didn't take care of it. Uh, but we have to come to the place. Now, that's what happens in the spirit physical realm. But the same thing happens in the spiritual realm. We have to come to the place where we see the need to continuously keep ourselves filled with the Spirit. Because if we don't, we're going to run out of gas just as surely now as uh, uh, our car runs out of gas. Now, God reminded me of an old song that we used to sing that I think perf perf perfectly illustrates having our well refilled. One of the standards says, heaven came down and glory filled my soul. And I thought, you know what, the way we need to sing it is heaven came down and glory filled my well, because that's exactly what happens. It keeps our well full when, when we get into God's presence. Heaven does come down and glory does fill our well. Now, you take that dear old saint now that we talked about earlier, who never heard of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but if they are taking the time now to spend quality time with the Lord, which a lot of those old timers did, that they spent time with, with God, and they were keeping their well filled because they were staying hooked to the source. And heaven does come down and glory does fill their soul, does fill their well, and they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And it shows on them. You know, you'll see these old people and you'll think, oh, they're so close to the Lord. They just have such a sweet walk with the Lord. 
And it does make a difference, just exactly like it showed on Moses now when he came down off the mountain after having been with God. They glow, they radiate, they're different. But they're going to find that being filled with the Spirit is never going to be enough in and of itself to give them all the equipment that they need for ministry. Now, it fills them up, and they can be so close to the Lord, but they're really not out doing that much ministry usually. And um, uh, what it does give them is, is a peaceful, calm trust down on the inside where the fruit begins to show. So... Uh, and I'm not saying that they never witness. A person can come by and receive help and get a drink of living water every once in a while and be refreshed, just like someone can come by and get a physical drink uh, from a farmer's well. But they will never be able to be the permanent source of supply as efficiently as God intends them to be if they literally are only operating out of a well. It's not going to work just operating out of a whale if we want to make a difference in getting people into the kingdom. Now, remember, a whale was never intended to furnish water for the whole community. There's life there in the whale, but there's no overflow. Now, an overflow comes from being baptized. That's where the overflow comes. Although they're two different experiences, it's still not a matter of choosing one or the other. God gave both of them to us because they're both so needed. Both are required and both are essential, and we can't do without either one of them effectively. Now, we said earlier that the baptism is a one-time experience. You can point to a definite point in time and nail it down when you know you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's a one-time deal. And it's what prepares us for service. It's what prepares us to go out and be a witness. And uh, in Luke 24, 49, he said, I'm sending the promise of my Father. Now, remember the promise of the Father and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, they're one and the same. But he says, wait in the city of Jerusalem until you are clothed with power from on high. Now, I'm reading out of the New American Standard. And uh, where do we wear clothing? We wear it on the outside. The baptism means immersion now. The Holy Spirit who's on the inside from the time of the new birth, we have the Holy Spirit on the inside, but literally it flows out and, he, and it literally covers us inside and out. We have some uh, wrought iron furniture that we bought down in Mexico and has a lot of little curly cues. And I used to try to paint it with a brush and I'd never be able to get all the little curly cues painted, you know, even with a spray gun. I'd try that and I couldn't do it. Well, I wondered how they did it at the factory. And once we were down in Mexico and I saw how they did it, they had a big vat of paint and they would take that piece of furniture and literally dip it down inside the paint. And uh, when they did... Uh, then when they brought it out, it was covered all over, every square inch of it. Well, that's exactly what happens to a person who is spirit baptized. That's why, that's why it's so, uh, so wonderful. Uh, in an instant of time, the Holy Spirit literally immerses us, and it's a clothing that covers us, you know, from the top of our head to the tip of our toes. And uh, it equips us then for the work that's ahead of us. Now, Ephesians 6.18 lets us know that the baptism, praying in tongues, is a part of the spiritual armor because he tells us to pray all the time in the spirit. Now, our work involves going into the war zones and going into enemy territory, and we need that protective covering. Now, in the natural realm, there are men who work in dangerous areas, and you've probably seen them. They'll wear these hard hats, and uh, they have special gloves and safety shoes, safety glasses, uh, and they wear that when they're in the danger area. The only difference is God intends us to keep our spiritual protection armor on all of the time. It's not to ever come off. It's permanent because we live in a fallen world, and we need that protection all the time. And that's why Jesus commanded, he didn't suggest, but he commanded, don't leave Jerusalem until you've been baptized, until you get that clothing on. And that's what happens. The baptism clothes us. Now, we wouldn't think about going to work in the mornings without our clothes on. We wouldn't think about even going out and getting the newspaper without our clothes on. And yet there's so many, many Christians who go off to work spiritually, completely spiritually naked. And they don't even know they're doing this, and they're not... They're not prepared. They're not ready. And that's why it's spelled out so clearly in the Word of God. That's why he says, wait until you're clothed with power from on high. 
That's not a suggestion. It's a commandment. Now, we said earlier that Jesus compared this experience that brings life into our spirit man, this infilling. He compares it to a whale. And then Paul tells us to keep that whale full, you know. Uh, and then in John 7, 38 and 39, he tells us to go there to see what else Jesus compares the baptism to. And so in thir verse 38 and 39, he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart shall flow rivers. Here God's given us another picture so that we can better understand what he's trying to say. He said, out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. And by this, he was speaking of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Okay, so earlier he talked about a whale on the inside that springs up with life. But now he's talking about getting a river that flows out of our innermost being. So he's using another word picture that's very graphically painting a picture that gives us a message we need to grab hold of. Now, there's a difference between a well and a river, you know, even in the natural. The baptism of the Holy Spirit causes that Holy Spirit on the inside now to flow out like a river. Now, a well never fills up, never flows out, but a river can't be contained. A river flows out even out of its banks many times. Now, rivers are primarily to be used for other people. It, we have it in, inside of us, but it flows out of us. And when that river flows out, it, it gives water to other people. It's always there to meet the needs for everyone. Uh, not like that well that primarily just meets the, the physical need, but a river flows. Now, my grandparents lived on the Colorado River, and the very early settlers, they loved uh, to build their homes bordering the, the river. Because when they did, there, there was water for their crops, there was water for their cattle, there was water for everyone on that river. Even if you'll remember in Egypt, the Egyptians called the Nile River the source of life because that water was so important. And it supplied life for everyone. But primarily now, it's the well uh, by staying filled with the Holy Spirit that's going to supply you personally. That river now, uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that's the power flowing out to supply others. But uh, God has it fixed where you have, your supply is given and you have a supply for the world. And that's why both experiences are mandatory. Now, baptism is easy. It's a gift for the asking. You just ask for the baptism and, and you get it. You know, you, you don't even have to wait until you're good enough. That's what's interesting. But the fact that the daily infilling has to be done over and over and over, that takes a little more effort on our part, you know. We'll have one day when we're real close to the Lord, and boy, we get close to Him, and we get uh, ourselves filled up with the Spirit. But other days, we'll be busy, and we won't do it. But it's Satan's trick now to throw obstacles to keep us so busy that we don't keep that infilling going. Now, something very ironic, and, and I think this is interesting, People seeking the baptism are accused many times of selfishness. I thought this is interesting. I've heard people say when we tell them about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, no, that's selfish. I don't want that. That's sad that that is the connotation that people have. And uh, a lot of people will say, well, you're just trying to get something to edify yourself. Well, speaking in tongues does edify the spirit man. But basically, the baptism is the power for outreach. When we get the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's not a selfish thing. It's something so we can give it to the world. And um, it's to help others. But now the infilling, what, what we do daily on a daily basis, okay, that's what actually ministers to us and builds us up spiritually. Now, if people could ever see the baptism of the Holy Spirit as a part of the equipment that's issued to the soldier to be used for battle, I mean, it would take away the erroneous ideas about the baptism. They wouldn't see it as something selfish then. They'd realize it's, it's a power gift to be used for others. Now, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is given in preparation now for the work. You don't have to work to get it. It's a gift. But uh, then you use it to do the work. But that's just like the enemy's deception to keep people from the power that would free the masses by telling them that it's something selfish. And I thought, you know what? The enemy's going to use anything he can to try to keep us from the very thing 
it, it, this life-giving that we have to have. Now, some people are afraid of it because it is a river, and it's a river force, you know, uh, to get the job done. And that's why there's so many jokes about someone needing to be locked up for six months. You know, you'll hear that, or after they get the baptism, they're accused of swinging from the chandeliers, you know. Well, it, it is a power gift, but that power gift is not for us necessarily. It's for us to do the work. And uh, it's demonstrative, and it has to be to get the job done. Now, rivers are aggressive. They're bold. They move things. It's enthusiastic. The baptism of the Holy Spirit reminds me of that little song that we used to sing when uh, we were in GAs in the Baptist church. It's bubbling, it's bubbling, it's bubbling in my soul. I'm singing and laughing since Jesus made me whole. Folks don't understand it, nor can I keep it quiet. It's bubbling, 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 bubbling day and night. We used to love to sing that song, you know. And I thought, you know what? That describes the baptism so beautifully because it is bubbling, you know, in our soul. And that's why that uh, little saint who is continually filled but never gets the baptism will certainly, that you won't say that they're lukewarm, but you would never think in terms of them needing to be locked up for six months, <laughs> you know, because uh, they're, not, they're not doing any damage out there. What they have is all contained. Uh, it's personal, but it's not an overflow of power. It's a whale, it's, it's, uh, but it's not a river. Now, the baptism and the gifts of the Holy Spirit are not earned. They're gifts. Any baby Christian can ask and receive the baptism and sometimes be used in the gifts even. And that's why it's possible to see a tongue-talking, spirit-filled believer operating in the gifts now because the gifts are given, that they're received in an instant, but the fruit is grown. And so we can ask for the gifts and we can feel so big and so important when we have the gifts flowing. But we need to realize the fruit is important and the fruit is grown and it takes time to grow something. And that's why being spirit-filled and being spirit-baptized are designed by God to work together. It takes both of them. Now, these two infinitely different experiences are meant to go together. Now, there's two reasons why they have to go together. Reason number one, the baptism alone now, you'll get pretty empty if you're not daily getting filled with the Spirit. The, the baptism you're giving out, but you'll get empty. But if you're, uh, if you're giving out daily uh, uh, filled with the Spirit without the baptism, you're unequipped. And that's reason number one why the two work together. And then reason number two is because it's during now these times of infilling that uh, your personal relationship with Jesus Christ uh, is going to grow. And it's the personal relationship with Jesus that's going to cause the gifts and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit and the baptism not to be misused, not to be abused. Now, anytime there's ministry or outreach and it's not a byproduct of your personal relationship with the Lord, you're going to find out that it will finally become what the Bible describes in 1 Corinthians 13, a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Okay, have you ever heard a little child trying to play an instrument and it's just a lot of noise and it's bothersome? Okay, that's what happens when a person operates in the baptism without the daily infilling. It'll oftentimes turn people off instead of turning them on. And just the opposite, when the infilling is there without the baptism, then your effectiveness is limited. Over and over, it shows us that it takes both. Now, it's a popular sermon now to preach, live the Spirit-filled life, and we hear that a lot now. And, and that's good. There's nothing wrong with that, and it should be taught. But where it becomes wrong is when it's taught that that's all there is. You know, Smith Wigglesworth, he said, he who has an experience is not at the mercy of the man who merely has an argument. Now, it's sad because um, uh, there's one group over here so busy trying to prove they've already got it all and they don't need the baptism. And then there's the other group, the ones who have experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they're so busy trying to prove that it's vital, that it's a legitimate experience, that too often they're too busy to stay filled. And both groups are missing out. We see that so often. So for those now who have experienced being filled with the Spirit and have their well full, I suggest that they look into the baptism that Jesus talked about in Acts 1 verse 5 that's going to give them the power. That which Jesus referred to as a river.
Now, the river that perhaps might make you feel the need to be locked up for six months because sometimes, boy, when the baptism is, is there, you, you just see all these things that need to be done and you want to do them all. And on the other hand, though, for those who have the baptism, but they're experiencing the emptiness that we described earlier, I challenge us to find out what it means to be daily filled, to go back to the original well and see where it has become a broken cistern. I challenge you to experience the intoxication of the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us to be intoxicated. And the Word says in Ephesians 5, verse 18, don't be drunk with wine, but be drunk with the Spirit. Be intoxicated with the Spirit. You know, it would be good for every one of us every day to get a good dose of Holy Spirit intox intoxication. Uh, now, the enemy has stolen the knowledge of the real source of intoxication. You know, uh, the world... They read that in the Bible, and they think they've got to have wine and strong drink for intoxication. But that's a counterfeit. The counterfeit lets us see some qualities of the real thing. But it's, it's not the real thing. The world is still running after things in the world rather than hearing what God's really telling us to go after. Wine or strong drink causes one to lose his reasoning capability, so he becomes intoxicated by the drink and that's a perversion. God wants us to lose our fleshly reason, and he wants us to be intoxicated or, or completely overcome now by the Spirit of God himself. We need to be intoxicated. That needs to be something that happens every day, but uh, not a counterfeit. He wants us to become totally Holy Spirit controlled. Now, we've looked at the difference between the baptism of the Holy Spirit and being filled with the Spirit. One is a well, one is a river, and it takes both, because this is, how, this is how they work together. Now, as we begin to concentrate on keeping our well filled and entering into a love walk, people are going to be drawn to us. That, that's going to make people come. They're going to be pulling it out of us. It's not going to be that we're going to have to be trying to push it on them. They're going to come. They'll be knocking on your door wanting to know what it is that you have because they know you have something they want that they need. And then that's when the rivers of the Holy Spirit, the power and the bonus, will overflow to supply their needs. Our spirit-filled life will draw them. Our baptism of, of, of uh, rivers you know, will minister to them. And God didn't suggest one or the other. He commanded that we wait for both. Father, I thank you, Lord, that we don't have to fight over whether it's being spirit-filled or being spirit-baptized. I know, Father, that the Christian world is fighting over that so much, but, Father, you gave both of them to us. It's two good gifts, and one, we need both of them. One is for us to grow, and the other is for us to give the word out. And I pray, Father, that you'll help us to understand that they're both legitimate gifts from you. And you're telling us, get them both. Get everything that you have. Lord, you, you don't want us to turn down anything. Every gift you have is, is to bless us and then help us to minister to the world. Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.